John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll be in Mark chapter 15, and we'll start in verse 16 here in a second, but happy Easter to everyone, and so welcome everyone. We're glad you're joining us this morning. We need to remember that the church is the people, not the building. So if you are a believer and you're listening this morning, you are a part of the church today. In the church service we have today, we're going to worship the Lord as we remember his resurrection. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we pray that you help us remember what your son has did. As he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again. And we celebrate that. That is a, a major truth of our Christian faith. Lord, we do pray for those in our church, Father, who are out and about the, every day, that you give them safety and protect them, Lord. And for the families of those in our church, Father, who are serving in many areas of Every single day, Father, we pray you protect them and also take care of them, Lord. We pray for those who have medical issues or those who are pregnant, Father, that you take care of them during this time and help them to get the, the, the doctor treatment and things they need done, Father. And we pray, Lord, for us as a church, you help us continue to be busy about your work, sharing the gospel with the lost, Father, and encouraging and edifying one another. Even in times like these, Father, we can still encourage each other. And Lord, we thank you for your son as he gave up everything. As he died on the cross, Father, alone, so that we might be able to have everlasting life and be with you forever. We pray, Father, that your word would have power this morning. We pray that if there's someone listening that does not know Christ as their Savior, that today they would believe in the death, burial, and awesome resurrection of our glorious Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. So if I had asked you this morning... Uh, what does Easter Sunday mean to you? Well, this year is going to mean something different, right? Typically, we would have big Easter celebrations and lots of large egg hunts and people gathering together for big meals and different religious or group sessions and things getting together. And so Easter has changed a little bit this year, but Easter itself has not changed. For Easter is remembering the resurrection of our Lord. And whether we do it in a large group or we do it in our home this morning, we can still remember what Jesus has done for us. And that's what matters. All the other things is tradition. 
You don't find those in Scripture. But what we do find is remembering what the Lord has done for us. And this morning, I would like to start in Mark chapter 15, verse 16. And I'd like to read down through verse 20, even though we'll look at most of chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16. Then the soldiers led him away to the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And began to salute him and saying, Hail the king of the Jews! And then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him and bowed the knee before him as they showed like they were worshiping him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off of him and put on his own clothes and led him out to be crucified. So this morning as we look at the resurrection of the Lord, we've got to remember what led up to the resurrection was his death, his burial. And then again, what we celebrate today, the resurrection. So verses 15 and 16 talks about how Jesus was beaten and mocked. He was beaten a little bit earlier in the night by the religious Jews, who pronounced him dead without giving him a fair trial. Now we come to the situation here where the governor has allowed him to be beaten by the Roman soldiers, be mocked, be ridiculed. It's interesting how the, more, uh, the brutality and the sarcasm of the Roman soldiers are extreme. Matthew offers a more careful account of how the soldiers use commonly available objects. A soldier's cloak as a royal robe. Thorny twigs twisted together to form a crown. And a cane and a scepter to mock Jesus with as they also used it to beat him with. The crown was made out of thorny branches twisted together. The crowns had a great emphasis in Jesus' day, especially in the Roman culture, because a crown of leaves and, and twigs would be woven together and given to someone who would win a Roman ga uh, game of some sort. And it also, a lot of times, if you see pictures of Roman coins, you'll see that the emperor has a crown of twigs and leaves on his head, and it's, it was a symbol of royalty at the same time. So Jesus was beaten with this reed. He was fit upon. him. Both added again to the brutality that Jesus had already fa faced earlier by the Jewish leaders doing similar type things. Jesus then is stripped of his royal robe. Most likely the crown though stayed on his head. Because it's not mentioned in any of the gospels being taken off of him. He was crucified in verses 21 to 32 like a wicked criminal. Psalms 22 is one of those psalms that's called the Messianic Psalm. It, it, it deals with how the Messiah was supposed to suffer. And it talks a lot of it about the suffering that Jesus went through. Then we come to Simon the Cyrenian, who was most likely a Jewish man for Cyrene, to Israel to celebrate the Passover like many Jews have showed up. Only Mark mentions his children, and this seems to suggest their familiarity to Mark and also to Mark's audience as he's writing the gospel. Mark mentions Simon and his children, strongly suggests that this gospel was written during the time that his children were still alive, and those who knew them recognized them. Simon is commissioned to help Jesus to carry that heavy cross as Jesus cannot bear it from being completely weakened physically in his human stature. Even though he was still all God, he was still all human at the same time. So once he arrives to the place where he's going to be crucified, whatever clothes he has on, all of them were stripped off of him. He was left to hang on the cross naked. He was nailed, and then the cross would be dropped up into a hole to put it in position. The soldiers offered Jesus drink. It was a bitter type drink that most likely was some form of poison that causes extra pain and extra eventually causes death along with it. Later on, though, Jesus is offered another drink by a compassionate people, which is most likely a combination of wine and maybe myrrh, which was maybe used as a painkiller to, to, to take away the sense of the pain he was feeling as he was beaten and as he hung on that cross. Mark divides up these events coming up in three-hour segments. 
He talks about the, the third hour being 9 a.m. when Jesus was placed on the cross. Jesus spends about nine other hours with three of them being in total darkness. And his body is removed on the twelfth hour, or before the twelfth hour, which began the Passover. Even on the times of Jesus, the scale of his death and everything that took place, it all had to be done before sunset. Which was remarkably, since soon after that, he was placed on the cross, for he gave up his life. He gave up his life. It was not taken from him. He surrendered it as a sacrifice for you and me. Jesus has only has two other criminals crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. Mark is probably emphasizing this to point us back to where two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, requested to be one on the right hand and one on the left hand of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. I think at this point they probably are pretty sure they are glad they're not on his right hand and on his left hand as he hangs there on the cross. All the popular support was Jesus' teachings that had gained great notoriety and proceeded throughout the, the, the area of Jerusalem now has all evaporated. As it grew during the weeks leading up to this, now you almost see no really followers of Christ. The powers and the rulers of the government had failed him. He is condemned to die the death he did not deserve. As he hangs on the cross, he continues to be mocked and ridiculed by a variety of people. Then we come to his painful death, verses 33 to 37. The darkness at this crucifixion was like none other. and prepares us to hear Jesus' dreadful loud shout from the cross. Then to witness the striking manner in which he died. For his death was just as amazing as his life had been lived. For the temple curtain was ripped when he died. The centurion uses the title saying, the son of God. Mark uses this reference to point us to really who Jesus was. And the significance about, around his amazing life. And now concerning his death, preparing us here soon for his burial and his resurrection. The darkness takes place in the middle of the day and most likely continues to the end of the third hour with the death of Christ. Accounts of the ancient crucifixion indicated a gradual loss of strength and consciousness. So Mark emphasizes and makes a statement that the last words of Jesus that he had as he was at probably at his weakest point aren't just a mumble, they're not a whisper, it's a loud shout as he gives up his life for us. Jesus is not going to die with a whimper, but in the full possession of his faculties and in the power of God that he still had, as he was still 100% God. The loudness and the painful his cry highlights the depths of the emotions he was facing and he was experiencing, and, and, and as he... He is dying there alone on the cross. Then we come to verses 38 to 41. Witnesses to his death, Mark records. He records a Roman soldier again who says, the Son of God. Even though he may not know what he meant, but he knew that there was something special about Jesus. Then Mark mentions the women who were present, who would be the focus of the rest of his book. This marks a remarkable shift in the gospel's emphasis. The nearest we have to women followers have been the anonymous woman who anointed Jesus back in 14, chapter 14. It is only at this point when Jesus' male followers have fallen by the wayside that Mark emphasizes the female followers and that they are ready to pick up where the men had left off. Women still play a major role in the life and the growth of the church even today. For many churches would have closed their doors long ago if it was not for the godly women of the church. Even now, while we are practicing social distancing, many of our women are busy doing things to keep our people connected. And they are encouraging others in many ways. The body of Christ is still ministering. The body of Christ is still working. The body of Christ is still out there because it's made up of the people. 
That's the church. And we are the church. If you're listening again this morning and you know Christ is your Savior, you are the church. Then we come to 42 and 47. Jesus' body is given a proper burial respect. A Jewish type burial. Jesus was most likely buried late afternoon or early evening before the sun went down. On a Friday, most likely. The Sabbath and the Passover would have started as soon as the sun went down. And he had to be buried before then. Crucified bodies were given to family members to be buried. But here we have Joseph of Arimathea asking for the body of Jesus, and he is not a family member. To receive the honorable burial that was proper for a Jewish man as Jesus, to be able to have a burial in a rock tomb was highly unlikely for any non-wealthy Jew, but especially someone who was killed or murdered or crucified, as Jesus was, being seen as a criminal. So even in this case, it depended completely upon the goodwill of a wealthy man, an influential member of the Sanhedrin who did not agree with everyone else. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph most likely went against the rest of the Sanhedrin in their verdict and their treatment of Jesus. And now he is here showing that he has become a disciple of Jesus. He's become a true believer. We are told that Nicodemus also helped him out in other gospel stories that we have. So we have the desires of a rich man to sacrificially use his wealth for Jesus' dead body. And so he most likely at this point was a true believer in Christ. For he goes to great lengths to make sure Jesus has a traditional and an honorable burial. By doing this, he made clear statement that he went against the rest of Sanhedrin. And he believed that Jesus was the true Messiah. And he was willing to face the repercussions for his choices. It's hard sometimes when we serve God and do what Christ wants us to do, what God wants us to do, and our family and our friends and our neighbors make fun of us. But here, Joseph does what he has to do because he feels convicted to do it. Remember in John 3, 16 and 17 that Kyle quoted earlier. In this passage, again, is the passage where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about becoming a true believer. Now, if you're listening here and you have never trusted in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, please listen up as I want to tell you a little bit about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night for fear of what might happen to him by the other religious leaders if they saw him talking to him. He no longer is fearful at this point as he's there with Joseph of Arimathea. Or is he ashamed? He's no ashamed at all. He's like Joseph. With this burial body of Jesus, he's there. He no longer is fearful or ashamed. They both would have become ceremonial unclean for touching the dead body of Jesus. And doing so during the Passover caused great repercussions for those who wanted to participate. And he would have been labeled a traitor by his neighbors for doing this. So if you're listening to this message, maybe you're like Nicodemus. And when he came to Jesus at night, he wanted to know how can he be saved? Or how can he get to heaven? Maybe you're thinking, that, how can I get to heaven? How can I get saved? How can I become a believer? First, you must believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He was all God and all man at the same time. We need to believe that he was perfect. He never sinned. He was sinless. We have to remember as he dies on the cross, that he died for your sins so that they could be forgiven. That he was buried for your sins. And that he rose. Ar that he arose. That he arose so that you, by believing in him, would also arise from the dead and spend eternity in heaven with God if you believe in him. That's what we celebrate today. That's why we celebrate. It is the foundational truth of the Christian faith. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Without it, we wouldn't have our Christian faith. Pilate grants Joseph the body, 
And he has determined that Christ has already been dead because Pilate makes sure one of the soldiers stabs Jesus in the side just to make sure that he is dead before he's taken off the cross. And so Joseph uses his own personal burial place that he has bought for himself, that one day it was going to be used for him, but instead he uses it for Jesus. Very few Jews could afford their own personal tombs. So he sacrificially gives up his so that Jesus' body would have the proper burial, an honorable Jewish burial. Then the stone that is wider at one portion than the other, kind of like a cork or a, a cone, it's wide at one side and, and narrow at the top, and it was basically pushed into the cave. And as it was pushed in, the narrow part went in first, and it was pushed in until it slid tight with the wider part. This made it hard to open back up again. So this made it hard for grave robbers to be able to come, and one person wouldn't be able to do it by themselves. Two or three men may have a hard time doing it. And so it was done in such a way to protect the body, and that was what was buried with the body. The other Gospels tells us the religious leaders, out of fear of remembering Jesus saying that he was going to raise from the grave on the third day, out of that fear they asked to have a guard put at watch in the cave at the tomb. And so they have a watch put there. They had wax poured around the outside. And then they took their signet rings and poked it into the wax before it solidified. So it would leave the emblem showing that it was the wax that was put there while they were there to make sure that Jesus' body wasn't taken by his disciples. So when the religious leaders had everything done, they had their guard appointed, they went and celebrated themselves. The religious leaders requested again that the tomb would be watched at least for three days. Because that's how long it was Jesus said that he would be in the grave for. Then we come to chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Here we have in Mark's gospel a great biblical truth, again, of, the, of our Christian faith and the foundation that Jesus' body is no longer in the grave. For he is risen. That's what we celebrate today. What is this story of Christ's death and burial? That If it had a different ending, what would it mean? It would mean we would not have our Christian faith that we have. Without it, we do not have our Christian faith. We have to have the tomb for his body to be buried in. We have to have him coming out of the grave on the third day. That is what our faith is based upon. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That affects how our faith is if that never happened. There's a lot of people who say, well, it didn't happen that way. If it didn't happen, we don't have our faith that we believe in. And I believe that he did raise from the grave on the third day as recorded in God's word. So Mark tells us that the female disciples come to Jesus' tomb early in the morning on the third day, which was a Sunday. It came, they came on a Sunday to finish the rest of the burial tradition that was left undone by Joseph and Nicodemus. Because of the haste to get Jesus' body to put in the tomb before the Passover started, there were a few other things the ladies wanted to make sure were done. They were wondering as they left the city to go to the tomb, most likely in their mind, as how are they going to roll away that stone? How are they going to pull it out of that locked position and roll it out of the way so they can get in there and finish anointing Jesus' body the way it needs to be done? So they show up to the tomb, and there they find there is no body of Jesus. An angel told him that Jesus is no longer dead. He's no longer here, for he is risen. He is risen. Jesus has been telling people throughout the Gospel of Mark not to tell anyone about him. Not to tell them who he is. And now he comes and tells the ladies go and tell go and tell. Many of them were scared and fearful to even go tell. There was a lady later on that did. 
Even though she was scared and fearful and frightful, she was also excited. And she goes and tells the disciples. Most likely this woman is the one who may have been possessed with demons earlier. And she goes and tells the disciples. Like you have probably told others about Christ, some people just won't believe you, will they? But she told people, and some didn't believe her. But eventually then, some of the disciples did believe. Then we have Jesus as he appears later on to the men on the Emmaus walk. As they're on the road to Emmaus walking there, Jesus appears to two men. That evening, he appears before his disciples. The first time Thomas wasn't present, the next time he will be. He commands them to go out and make disciples. He makes sure several more appearances before the disciples and others, and telling them, preparing them for the work that laid ahead of them, the preaching, the teaching of God's word. Telling the world about what Jesus has done, his death, his burial, his resurrection for the forgiveness of the sins. That was what Jesus wanted them to do then. That's what he wants us to do now. The church was the people. They didn't have a building then. Church buildings did not come into existence until several hundred years later. And very few of them at that point. It wasn't almost until we would call the medieval ages before churches became popular. So what was the church? It was the people, not the building. And the same thing is today. Though we cannot gather together in a building, we can gather together in mind, soul, and spirit as we worship the Lord together this morning. So even right now as you're listening, if you know Christ as your Savior, you're part of the church. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you never asked Him to forgive you of your sin, you never believed in His death, burial, and resurrection, do so today so you can come be, become a part of the family of God, that you would also become part of the church body. So are we fulfilling Christ's commands to go and to tell and to teach the gospel to those around us? We can use our talents even today as we have to practice social distancing during this virus outbreak. Because again, the church is the people, not the building. There probably again someone who's listening and you're like Nicodemus, you want to know, how can I get saved? Again, you've got to believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he promises if you do that, and you believe it deeply in your heart, he will save you. He will take you to heaven. You will become a child of God. As believers, this Easter is different because we can't spend it with family, can't spend it with friends. Kids aren't able to go do large egg hunts. But most of that's tradition. The true meaning of Easter is remembering the death, burial, resurrection, that he arose. And you can do that in your home this morning. You can also get on your phone and call family members and talk with them and share few, uh, things that are going on. You can use different type of technology to, to, to see people face to face on the internet. But Easter is still the same today as it was in Jesus' day, is to remember that he arose. And may you find comfort in knowing that God loves you. God cares for you. Even though you may feel all alone, disconnected, Jesus is there for you. He knows what you're feeling as he felt that out on the cross. And he cares for you. May God bless you and encourage you. May he guide and direct you. And may we as the church, the people, do what we can to continue the ministry of the gospel and encouraging one another. Let us pray.
Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, again, we thank you that your son was willing to leave his throne of heaven, to be born in a, a, a middle-class family life, Father, to grow up and never sin just so he could die for a sinner like me and those who are listening, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you it wasn't just his death because that wouldn't have been enough. We thank you that he overcame death and that he arose as we celebrate today. That he came out of that grave with the power of God so that he would be able to save all mankind who would believe in him. And Lord, the one that may be listening this morning that does not know Christ, help them to understand that. Open their hearts, Father. Ask them in their hearts to accept Christ as their Savior. To believe in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, we thank you as we as a church get to worship you and glorify your name and remember our risen Savior. For we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And may God bless you.